The following sets of slides are going to be delivered in two parts and deal specifically with dietary fats from a perspective of classification and identification of the main biological functions as well as dietary fat digestion and absorption. These slides are meant to accompany and supplement the information given in lectures to the year two undergraduate metabolism students as well as the masters of nutrition students from their dietary fats and fat recommendations lectures. So when you classify lipids uh, from a dietary perspective, we generally think of three main classes or groupings uh, for these lipids. This would be the fatty acid or triglycerides, sorry, and triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols. There are other lipids, and depending on the perspective from which you are looking into lipid metabolism, other lipids such as glycolipids are relevant and important. Uh, for various biological and cellular processes. However, we're not going to touch uh, on any of these in the slides. What you do need to remember as we go through is that each of these class of lipids has unique structure, unique biological function. They come from different sources in the diet as well as different uh, sources when they are produced endogenously and they all have different implications on health and disease, both positive and negative. This slide gives you an indication of the working definition that I'm going to use throughout these uh, next few slides. Uh, fatty acids and triglycerides listed here above, as well as phospholipids and sterols. So firstly, let's look at phospholipids, a very important uh, component for cell membrane uh, formation. This is made possible because of the amphipatic nature of phospholipids, wherein they have a polar head group uh, made up of an organic molecule and a phosphate group as well as a fat or uh, soluble or lipophilic region which is generally made up of two fatty acids bonded to a glycerol moiety. Um, as you can see from this cartoon you have the organic head as well as the phosphate group residing in the aqueous media while the lipid media is w where the fatty acids tend to reside or will reside. Examples of phospholipids are phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylserine, and phosphatidylinositol, uh, sorry, phosphatidylethanolamine, uh, apologies. Uh, generally they follow the same principle in terms of their structure where you have the phosphate group, the organic head group, and then the two fatty acids of various chain lengths, size, uh, bonded to the glycerol, which is here. Uh, so Structurally, they differ, and because of these structural differences, they can fulfill different roles when they are present in a biological membrane. Phospholipids have the unique property of organizing themselves spontaneously into bilayers when they are found in water or aqueous media. And uh, this is given here through the example of phospholipids plus water, and you can see the arrangement of a monolayer where you have auto arrangement of the lipophilic end. Then you have the arrangement of the bilayer where you now have uh, basically a mirror image of these monolayers. They can exist in several fashions, one being uh, uh, spherical in nature but not forming uh, specifically a bilayer in the sense that it uh, could be a spherical cone with all the lipophilic re uh, f fatty acids um, directed inward to the core or you can form vesicles uh, which is example D uh, where you have the arrangement of the lipid bilayer in a circular fashion uh, we just consider this a cross section through a sphere where you can have the exterior and the interior both being uh, hydrophilic areas. And they can also arrange in more complex layers where you have multiple bilayers um, uh, folding up on top of each other uh, forming again uh, two lipophilic regions, or sorry, uh, hydrophilic regions, uh, interior and exterior, and you can have different spaces in throughout. Typical thickness of a phospholipid bilayer tends to be between 30 and 50 angstroms. That's about three or five, three to five nanometers. Next, we're just going to touch on cholesterol and some of the other dietary uh, important sterols. This is the structure of free cholesterol, the chemical structure. You can see the generally conserved sterol ring structure here in the center. Most, if not all, sterols 
tend to have this structure conserved within them and you get your variations in uh, the level of saturation of the bonds within the ring as well as the side groups uh, as attached to this ring. So in this case you're seeing free cholesterol as I mentioned. This is the form of cholesterol which is found generally in cell membranes. Um, it's also the form of cholesterol which would tend to be metabolically active in processes uh, such as the synthesis of bile acids or the synthesis of vitamin D. The other main form of cholesterol is a cholesterol ester. These tend to be referred to as the storage forms of cholesterol. So if you have a lipid vacuole or a vesicle, sorry, uh, or, or lipid droplets in cells or adipose, the sort of thing which contain uh, cholesterol esters, they will tend to be in the format or in the form of uh, as seen here where you have a fatty acid esterified here. Uh, at the hydroxyl group. Um, the particular fatty acid which binds in, uh, or esterifies to cholesterol uh, does not necessarily have to come from one particular type of fatty acids, uh, fatty acid, but generally uh, endogenously synthesized uh, cholesterol uh, from the liver would tend to be uh, more than likely esterified to oleate. Cholesterol acts as a precursor. One of its main biological functions is the formation of other uh, molecules in the body which have biological action but require the sterol ring as their base structure. These include bile acids. Uh, here you can see two examples of bile acids, bile acids cholic acid and echinodeoxycholic acid. The conserved ring structure is here. However, you see there is no level of desaturation present. Um, but you do see variations on the side chains and the presence of this carboxylic acid group uh, out here. Vitamin D2, or sorry, vitamin D uh, is produced um, in the skin following exposure to UVB rays, and uh, its precursor is also cholesterol. You can see again the conserved sterile ring in the pathway to the production of cholesterol, or uh, pathway to to the production of vitamin D. Uh, the ring may undergo some uh, various um, uh, opening, closures, saturation, addition of methyl groups, uh, but generally you start with the same uh, starting point uh, here as you see with ergosterol. And thirdly, a third example would be hormones, in particular testosterone, estradiol, both precursors, or sorry, uh, both use cholesterol as their precursor in the synthesis pathway. Other dietary important sterols would be the plant sterols. Um, beta cytosterol is a good example, compesterol, and stigmastanol. Each of these, as you can see, also has a conserved ring structure. However, our bodies do not use these in any biological process. And in fact, we've evolved mechanisms in our gut to ensure that we do not absorb high amounts of these plant sterols so they cannot be um, uh, used or mistakenly used in the processes of our body which do require cholesterol. Uh, this is actually plays into um, the biological effect of consuming high amounts of plant sterol in that it lowers, tends to have a lowering effect on circulating cholesterol levels. Because the higher the amount of plant sterol you consume in the diet, the more active the mechanism for expelling them from the gut is and at the same time you do get a loss of cholesterol. So your net absorption or reabsorption of endogenous cholesterol in the gut becomes more negative thereby increasing the need for the liver to remove cholesterol from circulation. Another sterol which uh, is of biological importance to some extent, uh, coprostanol. This is the byproduct of microbacterial uh, metabolism of cholesterol. So this is not used as well. It's not used in biological processes in our body and we cannot reconvert this endogenously back to cholesterol. Therefore it's a waste product not reabsorbed and is lost in the feces. Now moving on to fatty acids and triglycerides. Triglycerides are by definition a uh, combination of glycerol and three fatty acids which are esterified to the glycerol moiety. Here I'm giving you examples uh, of n n different fatty acid types. Here is a saturated fatty acid, a monounsaturated fatty acid, polyunsaturated fatty acids. 
triglycerides can have varying fatty acids uh, in terms of their chain length and unsaturation bound at any given position on the glycerol and the final chemical structure resembles um, this cartoon here at the bottom of triglyceride where you can see we have a saturated a monounsaturated and a polyunsaturated fatty acid bound to the glycerol. I just mentioned saturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids, and polyunsaturated fatty acids and here are three examples uh, for you giving um, three different types of fatty acid definition as with them where you have saturated fatty acid indicating here the example being steric acid and its notation um, symbol being C180 where you have no double bonds introduced in the fatty acid chain. Monounsaturated fatty acids here the example I'm giving you is oleic acid its scientific notation is C181 here you see a double bond present between carbons 9 and 10. So it's the only double bond present, making it a monounsaturated fatty acid, and um, it is one of the more common monounsaturated fatty acids in our body. Then we have polyunsaturated fatty acids, and these are, as you can see, fatty acids which contain two or more points of unsaturation. Here I'm giving you the example of linoleic acid, which is uh, scientific notation would be C18 to N6, the N6 indicating that it is an N6 uh, or omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid. Generally, fatty acids are the simplest class of lipids. They are a straight chain of hydrocarbons with carboxylic ends. They have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions, and this is again using stearate as the example you see here the methyl end the terminus of the hydrophobic portion of the fatty acid and then the hydrophilic carboxylic acid group is shown right here as I said previously triglycerides are formed by three fatty acids form binding to a glycerol moiety via an ester bond the structure of a triglyceride does have uh, a particular structure to it in that the carbons of the glycerol actually do follow a particular pattern that's uh, very important in terms of the digestion and breakdown of the triglyceride by enzymes in the digestion process. These three carbons are described as the SN1, SN2, and SN3 positions. This is important during digestion because most of the lipases um, present both uh, in our gut as well as those in circulation are found in the adipose tissue will only act on the SN1 and SN3 positions and in doing so producing two free fatty acids and a monoacylglyceride. So you may have already noticed by now that there's no real way to distinguish between the SN1 and the SN3 position because they are interchangeable depending on which side of the molecule you are looking at. Uh, however, the SN2 position is unique and it does tend to be, uh, to, to, uh, in most circumstances, uh, be the fatty acid position which is retained during uh, lipase activity. So the introduction of the double bond can take two forms. It can be in the cis form or in the trans form. And then we know from public health uh, studies, uh, larger epidemiological studies, that the consumption of trans fats in our diet is a very negative aspect uh, and linked directly to heart disease um, and other metabolic disorders. So here you can see the trans fatty acid where the hydrogens uh, have been ad added uh, or sorry, the double bond's been added in such a way that the hydrogens are on opposing sides of the molecule. This produces what effectively resembles a saturated fatty acid in that it's still a straight chain uh, and there's been no chemical, uh, physical structural change as a result of the chemical change in the double bond. Here in the cis formation, you can see both hydrogens appear on the same side of the molecule and this has the effect of creating a kink in the chain and this particular kink in the chain has a, has a dramatic effect on the biological function of the fatty acid in that most of the molecular machinery in our cells can tell the difference between these two types of fatty acids despite the fact that they are essentially chemically identical. 
So just a small word about trans fats, they are formed during the process of partial hydrogenation, which increases the stability of the vegetable oils. In fact, uh, this allows you to produce uh, vegetable-based fats, which are more similar in nature to their physical structure and properties to that of animal fats but they are produced at a much more economical rate. However, more recent data, specifically public health epidemiological data, and then more recently in specific metabolic studies, has shown that trans fatty acids are very detrimental and uh, would be considered uh, pro-atherosclerotic, even more so than the saturated components uh, of animal fat products, which we've been trying to avoid in our diet for about the past 30 to 40 years. While they are important, the hydrogenated vegetable oils for, for some aspects in terms of how you can use the fats in food production, uh, it's been generally accepted now that the health risks outweigh the benefits and the food industry has moved away from partial hydrogenation, uh, more so now looking into blending fats uh, from natural sources. So the importance of fatty acids uh, in terms of biological membranes and their position and presence in phospholipids is illustrated by this slide. And you can see here we have lipid bilayers uh, with proteins. Here's the lipid bilayers. And you have different types of membrane-spanning proteins present within this membrane. And they give you an example of why varying chain length is important, as well as degree of unsaturation, because both of these proteins differ in terms of their own structure. And they both create situations where you require a very thick or uh, a large distance between the exterior and interior surface of the cell uh, of the um, phospholipid bilayer. And this would require fatty acids bounded to the phospholipid that have long chain uh, as well as possibly high degree of saturation, unsaturation. While here the second example shows you an example of uh, curvature stress uh, in that the biological membrane is being squeezed together and uh, because of a short protein being present in the, in the membrane and this would require short or very highly unsaturated fatty acids. So further to this idea of curvature stress uh, related to the membrane-bound proteins, um, you can see here in example A, you get different uh, folding um, and or inversion of fatty acids uh, relating to um, the type of fatty acid that's associated with the phospholipid. Here you see they are repelling, uh, forming a bend or a um, inversion in the lipid membrane. So you have to think of these as being cross-sections or a three-dimensional structure. Here they're in their normal configuration and here you have a protein which is bound to one side of the uh, bilayer but has a hydrophobic core which then allows the inversion of the fatty acid portion of the phospholipid into this region because of its hydrophobic nature. And then here another example of a membrane-bound protein. In this case, it's a transporter protein, which changes conformation and shape depending on a state of act activation or no activation. And you can see the requirement of the phospholipids to be able to compress without losing the uh, protein's association with the membrane is very important. So to summarize this section, we have Lipids generally are made up of four categories, triglycerides, phospholipids, fatty acids, and sterols. <coughs> phospholipids uh, are very important in biological membranes. Triacylglycerides are the main storage form of energy in our body, and they are very important for that reason. Sterols, they have a structural function, but they are also the precursor to the numerous other sterol-related molecules. And we can acquire these lipids both from dietary sources and from synthetic sources within our own bodies. However, some of these fats uh, are essential, and uh, in particular certain fatty acids are only acquired through the diet as we have no capacity to produce them ourselves. Biological importance of fats are, as I've already covered, membrane formation and integrity, energy source, i.e. beta oxidation and energy storage, cell signaling um, and metabolic control. Examples of this are cosinoid formation, steroid hormone formation, and the phosphatidyl inositol cycle. 
they also serve uh, functional purposes related to heat conservation in that um, subcutaneous fat prevents heat loss from our body, helping us maintain our core temperatures.